there we go. Um, because a lot of you, uh, and we already, of course, expected before we started the course, uh, a lot of you will use the Tenac genomic chromium method in order to generate single cell transcriptomics data. Um, because so many people are using it, we can go, we can spend a little bit time to go a little bit more in depth what's actually going on when you generate the data. And if you understand what's going on, that also makes things easier to troubleshoot, for example. So it's about, uh, I think about seven or eight slides or so, just some visualization on, on, on tenant genomics in general, or actually specifically this chromium method. So you have seen this image before in a previous presentation, just to as a recap. So what do you have? What is the main invention uh, that allows you to generate single cell transcriptomic data with this Chromium device? So this Chromium device is kind of uh, a cell sorter where the cells and gel beads move through, um, through the oil actually, and the gel bead and the cell, you hope that they are captured uh, in a single GEM. And because you associate a single gel bead with a single cell, you get, uh, and this, the, the, the gel bead has specific barcodes for that bead, you can actually um, find out later on after sequence, uh, sequencing which read actually came from which cell, or actually which read belong together in the same cell. Um, <clears throat> this image, uh, it, it looks like in this image that you actually, um, a lot of cells move uh, through the device more than beads, but actually it's the case that uh, cells are moving way more sparsely through the device than the beads. And because you do that, just by John, you expect that if a bead gets associated with a cell, then it's only one single cell, just because very few cells move through the device. So on the gel bead is that uh, a sphere is completely packed with oligos. And those oligos, they look very similar for all of them. So they all have the same adapter sequence within a gel bead, all have the same barcode. Of course, this difference between gel beads. UMIs, they differ between oligos. More about UMIs later on. And then we have the poly A tail or actually capture sequence. And nowadays we have more different capture sequences, not only a poly A tail, but also other sequences that allows you to capture, for example, um, <clears throat> these uh, indexes related to, to antibodies. Okay, so in this DEM, what you get is um, the cell gets lysed, you capture messenger RNA that is polyadenylated with this poly D oligo. And that means that all of those captured transcripts from a single cell, they have an identical within the same cell and unique barcode because all of the barcode oligos on the single gel bead are the same. So when you have that, uh, then you get a reverse transcription that still happens within the GEM. Then the GEMs are broken down and you get a fragmentation step, meaning that the messenger RNA gets broken into smaller pieces. Then you get the ligation of the primer, so the other end basically of uh, the, the, the library uh, is basically generated and you get an index PCR. And what you end up with is this construct over here. You have the P5 and the P7 that are required for Illumina sequencing in order to be able to new to a sequencing lane. We get um, the uh, uh, read one and the read two, which are the typical Illumina adapters. You get the barcode that is specific for the gel beat, the UMI, the poly DP, and then the, the part that is actually sequenced, the part of, of the individual gene. The other adapter, you get a sample index. So that's a typical index that is sequenced by Illumina in order to be able to um, 
demultiplex multiple samples, and of course, the P7. So when you start sequencing this construct, what you get is, of course, the adapter sequence uh, for uh, the forward read and the adapter sequence of the reverse read. The adapter sequence for the forward read is used to only sequence the barcode that is specific for the DLB and the UMI. Uh, anything else is kind of irrelevant because it will be only poly T or poly A. And the other adapter is used to sequence the actual uh, sequence of the transcript. And that is, of course, used later on to do the alignment, for example. And it also, uh, we also usually get a third uh, FOSQ call, for example. So we get read one, read two, and read three, or I1 actually. And that contains the sample indices. So how does it look? So you have brought your library or maybe your sample to the sequencing provider. They did the, 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 the library prep and the sequencing for you. Usually you end up per sample or actually per sequencing lane, you get three POSQ files. Read run and read two. Read run with only the uh, barcode and UMI. Read two with the actual transcript index and I1 with the uh, sample barcode. If you use dual indexing, you can sometimes or even get an I2. Uh, sometimes the I1 and I2 are both missing, and then usually the indices, they are added to the FOSQ type. So it are actually added to the FOSQ files themselves, the R1 and the R2. So after sequencing, so you have the raw FOSQ files. What's next? So then what's next is, of course, we have to figure out which, which read actually came from which cell or actually which read belong together in the same cell. The alignment and then the quantification for gene. So you have, you have, at some point you want to end up with counts per cell per gene. And also then figure out what is a cell and what's not because there will also be background RNA in there. More about it in a later slide. So for these four steps, typically for 10x data, uh, what you can do is use a software called Cell Ranger that is um, provided by 10x Genomics and does all of those four steps. So it's a single command, relatively straightforward to use, especially for model organisms. And um, you just run that on your FOSQ files and what you end up with, what you're mostly interested in, usually for downstream analysis, is this count table with cells and, and genes. Alternative uh, to using cell rangers are using Star Solo. Actually, Star Solo is used by cell ranger uh, under the hood, let's say. My apologies for the dog. Thank you very much. Starts getting active somehow, so for some reason. Um, another alternative is uh, using Elevin. So that's from the people who also developed Salmon and has a bit of a different way of uh, generating down tables. But I guess Cell Ranger is really the most used uh, software program to actually perform all these four steps to come from read data to actually account data, account table. <clears throat> um, of course, what Cell Ranger needs is a reference sequence because it's uh, one of the steps. So, step two is, of course, aligning the sequencing read to a reference genome, so you need a reference sequence, and it has to be relatively specific. Um, uh, in a way, you can just use uh, your reference genome and the, and the GTF, but the GTF has to be in a specific format. You can download it uh, from the 10x website for human and mouse. So that's like the, the, the standard um, <clears throat> would be the standard reference to use. So just downloading it and download it and you can get started. For other organisms, you have to make a custom reference with Cell Ranger MK rep. Also relatively straightforward to run um, if you have a uh, highly standardized genome and highly standardized GTFs. If you have any exogenous market genes like DFP, so you have done an experiment with, with DFP in there and you want to actually 
uh, estimate the expression uh, of, of DFP, you have to add it to your reference, of course. So uh, you, if you want to quantify something, you also have to align against the transcript. Of course, DFP is not part of the human and mouse genome, at least not by default. Um, human, yeah, human cell line DFP is possible. So uh, you have to add it to your pathway and to enter GTF, and then again, run cell range and MKREF in order to create your reference, and then you're good to go. Um, if you have other features other than, than genes, for example, uh, proteins, um, you will need a feature barcode reference TSV that actually specifies which barcode is associated with which protein, and then cell rangers can also work with that. So then about UMIs. So what are UMIs and why do we use them? So UMI, uh, so the, the, the abbreviation UMI stands for Unique Molecular Identifier. And basically it identifies, it's already kind of the name, it identifies each molecule uniquely, meaning it identifies each of those uh, constructs we are creating to do the actual sequencing uniquely. Which means that before you do uh, the actual sequencing on those constructs we create, so with the barcode and the, and the actual sequence in there and the UMI and everything in there, we do a PCR. Because without PCR, we do not have enough of those constructs in order to be able to do the actual sequencing. So we have to do a PCR. And then everything, all of the molecules or all of the fragments, constructs, concept is a better word, I guess, all of the constructs originating from the uh, same uh, initial construct will have the same UMI, meaning that if, let's say, you are going to sequence your entire library very deeply, at some point you will just sequence the same construct over and over again with the same UMI. They do not get any more information out of it. Uh, so we want to, uh, what we basically want is to have sequences in there with unique UMIs, because then we know we are drawing a part of a transcript that is not sequenced before. Uh, so therefore, we have UMIs in there. Uh, also, because uh, usually for ten economics, as you remember well, the libraries you create are usually not very complex, which means that you very quickly are sequencing the same construct over and over again. By counting these UMIs, you're actually correct for that. So you do not count the actual alignments as you're maybe used to for RNA-seq, you actually count the number of individual unique UMIs per gene. So you're directly correct for sequencing the same construct over and over again. Um, so when you have run uh, Cell Ranger, you get a report, a very nice report. Uh, I always look at it quite extensively, uh, which gives you uh, the main statistics that are important for, well, uh, the next steps in your analysis. One of them, of course, is, for example, the number of cells you have that are called, that are uh, considered uh, by uh, Cell Ranger as actual cells. Uh, you have the number of mean number of reads per cell, so that tells you about how many reads you have generated for per cell, and the median number of genes per cell, so how many genes you are actually measuring. Um, can of course differ for for tissue. Some tissues uh, you can expect more uh, reads, uh, more genes to be expressed than others, um, and some of course, and it depends very much on the cells that are in there. Um, then you get information about the total number of reads you have for that run, uh, the, for example, how many uh, reads aligned to that genome can be important, of course, or is usually very important, and how many reads uh, have mapped to the exo uh, so to exonic regions, to the actual genes. For human and mouse, usually the, um, <clears throat> the genome is well annotated or very well annotated, which means that uh, many of the reads are expected to align to an exonic region, so to a gene. Um, if you work with non-model organisms, usually annotations are not so, so good, meaning that um, 
regions that are actually genes are not annotated as being a gene. Maybe uh, UTRs are missing, for example. Typical problem is that pre-prime UTRs are missing, which means that actually the, the position that you are aligning your reads to is just missing in your reference genome. And then you get very low number of reads that maps to an exonic region, and therefore you do not take them into account when estimating gene expression. So these numbers over here about the mapping can be or are very relevant, and especially if you are working with normal organisms are very important to check. Uh, you get some information about the sample, about the chemistry that's used, that's usually auto-detected by, by cell ranger, that's very convenient, um, and of course about the cell calling. And about this. As you might have noticed, I own a dog and sometimes a bark. My apologies. So about cell calling. Um, very important part of, of running Cell Ranger. Uh, so what happens is, let's say you have your droplet, and in your droplet, in ideal case, in most of the cases, you both have a cell and a bee. However, uh, usually you also have free messenger RNA. You have free messenger RNA in tissue in general. And if you have been disassoci dissociating your tissue, very often you break down cell, you, 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 you cells get broken and they release messenger RNA. And if that occurs very frequently, what happens is that you get a lot of background messenger RNA in there. And that can be a bad thing because you do not know where this messenger RNA, uh, where it comes from. So very often, it also happens that you capture only background RNA uh, to get in, in, your, uh, in the droplet, meaning um, that you have, well, you're measuring messenger RNA, but they do not come from the same cell. So what, um, <clears throat> um, what cell range it tries to do is it compares or it, it looks at the, the distribution of the number of UMIs per cell. And it orders that in a graph and then looks for a steep drop. Because what you expect is that droplets with a cell, they contain a lot of messenger RNA and droplets without the cell, they, com they contain very little messenger RNA. However, if things didn't went very smoothly with dissociation, for example, uh, you expect a lot of background messenger RNA and then it becomes very difficult to separate um, droplets with a cell and without a cell because you have that much background RNA in there. And then you get plots like the, uh, the bottom right where you do not have a clear drop in the number of UMI per cell. And then it becomes very difficult to figure out what the cell and what not, what has only background in there. Uh, typically to solve this, well, you just have to deal with it as a biomedician. Uh, so often to me, if, if I show this to a customer, then they say, yeah, can you do anything with it? And I say, yeah, well, we can just try to get cells out of there to have a, have a, try multiple thresholds, for example, and see whether you get biological meaningful analysis out of there. But still it becomes very difficult to know what is a cell and what's not. Maybe in the UMAP later on, you can, Find signatures, but uh, it's not super easy to work. Um, so, uh, some other parameters to look at uh, in the cell range report is, of course, the number of captured cells. And of course, usually you want quite a bit of quite a few cells because the more cells you have, uh, the the better that is. Also, for for example, statistics, the, the more likely it is that also rare cells end up uh, in your sample. Um, but you can often not have too many because if you have too many cells, then the chances are much higher that you have a single bead associated with multiple cells. And of course, if you have single bead associated with multiple cells, then it's not single cell transcriptomics anymore. Then it's two cell transcriptomics. So um, there is a relation between the number of cells and the number of expected doublets. So if you go up to uh, 10,000 cells, you expect about 7% of those uh, beats being associated with more than one cell. And of course you do not want too many of those because they are actually quite difficult to identify these doublets. So in principle, you could filter for it, 
There is software for it, but it's not super trivial to do. So you want to be in between these 1,000 and 8,000. So not uh, too little cells because otherwise, well, uh, of course you do single cell uh, transcriptomics and you use 10X to have quite a few cells in there, but also not too many because otherwise you get doublets. Number of reads per cell depends very much on the library complexity you have, meaning that um, um, uh, at some point, just generating more reads per cell does not give you more information because you're sequencing the same construct all over again, over and over again. Um, <clears throat> but you want enough reads in order to be able to uh, sequence the entire transcriptome as much as, as you can sequence from that cell. Obviously. Typically, it's between 30,000 and 100,000 reads per cell. And then sequencing saturation tells you about whether it could make sense to generate, for example, more reads. So the sequencing saturation, if it's low, which means that you uh, do not uh, sequence the same construct multiple times, which means that it can make sense to generate more reads. If the sequencing saturation is very high, that means that you have been sequencing the same construct over and over again, and then also generating more reads does not make a lot of sense. And of course, uh, I already spoke about that the number of reads mapping to the genome and to the transcriptome. And typically what you can do, for example, is change your transcriptome if, uh, if you're working with a non-model organism, look at the annotation of, for example, the three prime nucleus. If that's not a very good annotation, then you might want to uh, change it by, for example, extending the gene length. 